and welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show. I'm your host, Deborah Kozowski. And as always, I like to bring special guests from all over the world. And today I have Holly Morphew. She is an AFC, is an award-winning financial coach based in Denver, Colorado. She's the founder of Financial Impact, a specialized financial coaching practice that helps entrepreneurs and professionals create personal wealth and financial independence. A pioneer in the personal finance industry, Holly's work has been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, Yahoo Finance, Femme Founder, and more. Host of the Wealth Trifecta podcast, Holly's professional background in finance, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, are foundation of the Financial Impact's transformational programs. Her book, Simple Wealth, was Bankrate's top 10 personal finance books of 2022 and is a number one bestseller on Amazon in nine categories, including personal finance, wealth management, credit repair, personal transformation, real estate, and women in business. Holly began teaching personal finance in 2006 as a service project with Rotary International and received the prestigious Rotarian of the Year Award for her work in financial literacy. She has also been recognized for bridging the gap for outstanding work in private practice as an accredited financial counselor. Holly has a BA from University of Colorado in international affairs and Japanese in, with minor in business. And today, Holly speaks, coaches, and writes about money, personal transformation, and creating a life of design. She loves to hike for fourteeners and watch the sunrise and hang out with dogs. Welcome to the show, Holly. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you, Deborah. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm going to just jump in because I don't know what the 14ers are. <laughs> well, 14,000 feet is the highest mountain that, that you'll find in Colorado, which is where I live. So 14ers means that you're summiting a 14,000 foot or higher peak. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so you climb many peaks. Um, oh, I especially... love hiking. Nature is one of my core values. Oh, it's beautiful. And you know, it relates so much to, you know, when I was reading your book and Simple Wealth is Holly's book. And uh, I have an opportunity to read this. So and I don't have one physically to hold up. Do you have one to just show everybody? Oh. Oh, there it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> I wanted to start off with a quote that starts right in chapter one. And it is, what you are is what you have been. What you will be is what you do now. And that's Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha. That so right. I would love for you to share what that quote means to you. Oh my gosh, Deborah, I just got emotional as you read that quote, because you know, I wrote this book in 2020 and it was published in 2021 and my life then compared to my life now is so very different. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of what I talk about in my book, it's not just personal wealth and financial independence. It is about becoming the person you want to be, who has the life you want to live. And that quote to me, as I listened to you say that out loud just now made me think, where do I want to go next? Like, who mm. do I want to be next? Because I'm very much a goal-driven person, which is, is good and bad, <laughs> you know, because, you know, the whole idea behind Buddhism is that we, we can accept where we are as perfectly perfect and, and know that everything is working on our behalf. Right. Um, yeah. but it's uncomfortable for me. And so as you read that, I'm thinking, gosh, maybe I should, um, make some new goals, but I think there's also some, not some, but a lot of value in just being content with where we are and what we have. And that's actually how I created personal wealth in my own life was just, you know, having a gratitude practice, you know, and raising my vibration and just kind of starting from there. You know, it's interesting, as you say that I think about different people in my life that I have encountered and the struggle comes from not having that contentness that we're always continually striving and one of the things that you know in the introduction alone it is building personal wealth means freeing up the energy and space to help us realize our potential mm -hmm. but when we are in a place of discontentment wanting to continually to strive 
we can't free up that energy. So I find that a fascinating piece. I, I would love your perspective on that. Well, money is energy, right? Like anything else in life. And there's a component to building wealth that begins with safety, right? So when we feel safe, then we can heal. And so, you know, some of your listeners might be in a place where I was when I began my wealth journey, which was um, living in a, a scarcity mindset and very much in fear because my wealth journey began with $67,000 of credit card debt living paycheck to paycheck. And it's not because I was stupid. It's not because I was irresponsible. It really was because, you know, I was doing what I call mental accounting, where I kind of had an idea of what was coming in and an idea of what was going out, but I didn't really have a plan. And I wasn't really looking at it. I wasn't really facing it. Um, but I do think that when we realize that we have full control over our thoughts and that every thought we have is actually a choice. That's when we can really take a step forward on our wealth journey, or it could be transformation. I really like to, so I'm a paradox. Like I have the, the very practical side, which is the, the money corporate finance, which is part of my um, professional background was working in corporate finance. But on the other side of it, when I started to open myself up to let's call it abundance, and, you know, the personal practices that create wealth and abundance was, which wasn't until, you know, probably 15 years after I began my own wealth journey is when I really started to understand that the practical side of wealth building, like wealth building is 20% strategy and the strategy is really important. And unfortunately we're not teaching it and a confused mm -hmm. mind says no. So it's so important to have the education around it. It's also important to talk about it, but 80% of the wealth building equation is actually mindset. And so coming full circle back to what you said earlier with the quote about what you will be is what you do now. I think about that myself because I'm on my own wealth journey and it's like, what, where am I wanting to expand into now? You know, because I became financially independent many years ago now, but I'm still living my life and I still want to feel, feel fulfilled in my life. And what I'm learning is abundance just it doesn't come just in the shape of money. Money is very important. And financial security, I think is, you know, it's at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once we feel safe and supported, you know, um, security of employment, security of, of money, then we can start to open ourselves up to deeper and more meaningful relationships, to realizing our potential, et cetera. You know, one of the things that I'm taking away from what you just said is that and you talk about in the book is wealth is for everyone. And I think when people have those struggles and think that, you know, some people can be financially independent and they're set for life. Right. But we have to understand that there's this whole journey. If I was to take a meter stick from zero to a hundred, wherever you are right now, look at how much more you have. If, if we said the life expectancy was a hundred and I would, you know, one of the things you talk about when, people ask you what you do for a living and you tell them, I love how you say that, you know, they, they right away will say, everyone needs that. This is important, but then they kind of lower their voice and then they tell you how it is. So I'd love for you to share your experience of how people, you know, when they think of wealth is for everyone and, and they think of their personal story, how can we fill the gap? Well, there are really two things going on here. The first thing is that wealth is a spectrum. And so wherever you fall on this wealth spectrum, which by the way, is infinite in all the directions, 360 degrees of infinity from the midpoint is the way I look at it, is that I work with people who received money maybe from an inheritance and they have shame around the way that they're um, living their life because they don't have to quote unquote work as hard as others. So there's whole, there's another element there of wealth. And for me, I think again, about abundance, like you might have money, but you might be unhappy. And then there are those who are on the spectrum, which is again, where I began my journey and why I'm so passionate about the financial education piece is like truly they are living in scarcity. They need money to pay their bills. And so I think that being on wherever you are on this spectrum, 
we start where we are and wherever we are is just perfect. And you don't have to be good at money to start, but you do have to start in order to be good. And that made me think of your story about volleyball. I would, you know, how about not quitting? So um, share with us what one coach said to you. About quitting? Yeah. And volleyball, well, your volleyball story. <laughs> well, volleyball is a game, right? And that's kind of how my book begins. And and I, I use the comparison that, that, you know, money is also a game, but essentially, you know, I was a competitive volleyball player for 23 years and I started playing in seventh grade. And of course I was the girl who grew a foot in one year. <laughs> so I was taller than everyone. I was definitely taller than the boys. And it was awkward for me, but I loved I loved sports. I loved being active. And so in seventh grade, I tried out for the volleyball team. And at the end of tryouts, one of the coaches came to me and she said, Holly, do you like playing volleyball? I said, yeah, I love it. And she said, well, I think you should find a different sport. And I was just completely heartbroken. I, I just, I, I wanted to play because it was fun and I loved the camaraderie and, you know, it was just a fun release and I just decided I wasn't going to listen to her. And I don't know if that was my intuition or my clairvoyance perhaps, but I just said, you know what, if she doesn't want me on the team, I'm going to find another place to play volleyball. And so the next year, of course, was eighth grade. And I tried out for the team and not only did I, I make a team, but I made the, the more competitive team. And that's really how it all began. And then, you know, in the middle of my eighth grade year, my family moved from Texas to Colorado and that really shook up my life, but I just continued to do what brought me joy. And that was always sports. And I went on to play in college. I played in Spain. I played um, at the open level, which is semi-professional in Colorado, again, where I live in the sand, um, sand doubles. And it was an amazing career. And I coached high school volleyball for 14 years. And I always took that lesson that I learned, which was, and I apply this a lot to my life where it's just an opinion. Like everyone has an opinion of what people should be doing. And when I went through my divorce in 2016, after 10 years of marriage, and we ran a very successful company together, which was the majority of my income at that time. So not only did my marriage end, but I had to start over, not from scratch, but mostly from scratch when it came to income. And I hired a coach and it was the first time I had ever really invested in myself, but I knew I needed to get some skills in order to become self-employed, become an online entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to be a great coach. I knew I wanted to be a better professional speaker, public speaker. And so he put me on a platform with, you know, some really heavy hitters, Bethany Frankel, um, Mel Gibson, Christy Brinkley, 50 Cent, John Travolta. Like these are some of the people, Al Pacino. I was sharing stages with these, you know, wow. creative artists, but long time career professionals who had remained at the top of their game for decades. Mm -hmm. And I realized two things during that whole part of my life, which was definitely a chapter in my own wealth journey was that I could be in a room with these really highly intelligent people who all have an opinion on what I should be doing with my life or my career or my business, or what's the right next step for me. But number one, my coach never asked me, what's your definition of success, much less what's your definition of business success or financial success. That question was never asked. It was just assumed that my version of success was his. And number two, that I could be in a room with all of these intelligent people who all have an idea of what I should be doing next. But really all that matters is my opinion, because only I know what I value. Only I know what kind of life I want to be living. And fast forward all these years later, you know, in, at the end of 2022 or 2021, I moved into my dream home, like the, the home that I've always wanted to live in where I have mountain views from every room and, you know, a big kitchen. I love to cook and, um, and I live on a lake and it's just, it's glorious, but it's like, 
what's next, you know, what's, what's the next version of success for me. And I do value simplicity. And there are many coaches and entrepreneurs out there, wealth builders, entrepreneurs who are preaching and teaching, go for a million dollars in revenue. Like for a long time, that was my goal with financial impact. My company is million dollars in revenue, $83,334 a month. Right. And while that still sounds like a lovely goal for financial impact, what I'm learning is that I have multiple income streams and I have a deep desire to develop one of those income streams because it means that I get to spend more time on my farm um, with animals and gardening, et cetera. And so it's, it's an interesting journey again, going back to like, where, where do we want to go and who's deciding what success looks like for you. Wow. That was very powerful, Holly, because I can think of many naysayers or different people who've shared opinions, even on my own journey and hearing from friends and family of some of the opinions that they've received from other people. But to remind yourself that it is only one person's opinion. And at the end of the day, the person looking yourself in the mirror is the person you have to answer to. So thank you very much for sharing that part of your journey. Yes. The one thing that, you know, that really gets us is that shame piece. And I know you talked about, you know, you often work with people who maybe have had an inheritance that don't have to work as much. But you also talk in your book about people having shame around money because they feel like they don't understand the jargon. They, they're, they're facing this relationship. They're confused about what to do. So they don't do anything, but they feel shameful that they should know more because they hear other people maybe in their families or, you know, at work or whatever, talking, you know, freely about money. And they're, they're sitting there like, uh, I don't know anything about it and kind of putting their head down. Yes. And that's, you know, Financial education is so powerful. I, I spoke at the uh, Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce a couple of weeks ago, and it was it felt so good for me to see the posture of these women after they left the room and their smiles and their enthusiasm about like, now I have something actionable that I can be doing with my money every single day so that I can become financially independent when I want to. And financial education should be free. That's why on my website, financialimpact.com, I have literally on my menu, free resources. And these are the resources that I used to get on my own path to financial independence when I was living paycheck to paycheck. And in my opinion, these resources really should be free. And personal finance, money management, uh, wealth building, investing, it truly is simple. And it's possible that people use more complicated terms for simple things because, you know, we all have an ego that, that we may or may not be aware of. And it, maybe it makes them feel smart and confident to speak in a way that sounds, um, really smart or really intelligent or, or complicated. And again, that's their story. My mission is to help as many people as I can with their personal finances, because well-resourced people, again, are living in this creative, expansive space where we can make better choices, not only for ourselves, but for our family, for our community. It allows us to connect more deeply with one another. And that's really what the world needs is all of us coming together to create a beautiful existence and a beautiful experience. And so if we're able to, you know, take care of ourselves, pay our bills and have a little bit of money left over or time left over in our day to do the things that we enjoy, then collectively we will rise. And I, and I think it would be so admirable to just to watch that posture change. Cause you know, when people get something or they have that shift it's not always like the aha on the face, but the posture changes. They, you can see that confidence shift. And, you know, when I think about the confidence shift and the way you said, you know, your transformation came about with personally became wealthy by acquiring assets and living lean. 
But there was one key factor that was trans that had to transform it all. You, you can acquire assets, you can live lean, but if you're missing this one thing, it's not going to come together. And that was the abundance mindset. How did you go about developing that? Again, I'm just getting chills I'm, and thank you for bringing that up. And I just really appreciate that, like that you get it and that we're bringing this forward because I think that's the reason that my book, Simple Wealth was such a success is because it's not just the strategy. It's the personal practices that transform you into a wealthy person and support you on a daily basis when we're out in the world being tugged on, you know, everybody wants our attention. Everyone's trying to get us to say yes to buying something or being afraid of something or voting this way or doing this or doing that. But again, it's about putting your race horse blinders on your laser beam focus and going toward that goal that you have for yourself. And for me, that goal was always freedom. You know, I was working 60, 70 hours a week. My first six years in the workforce, I worked in real estate and it was intense. It was intense. And I, I worked for a fortune 500 company and it was sales, sales, sales all day long. I was working on the weekends. I was working late nights. I even went into the office on my days off, which were Tuesdays and Wednesdays. It, and I was in my twenties at the time and, you know, financial capability, which is the, um, the willingness and the discipline to put your money into um, savings and retirement accounts and investments so that it grows and obviously earning more money than you spend. That's really financial capability. And that is a path to wealth. And it is the one that's most traditionally taught. But it wasn't until again, around the time of my divorce, when I realized I really wanted a different life for myself, I realized that I had been living out of alignment with my core values. I didn't even really know what my core values were. That's why there's an exercise in my book about getting really clear on what do you value? And then once we know what we value, then we can start spending our time and our money and um, creating behaviors that support those values. And that right in and of itself leads to more happiness. But that was around the time that I started to open myself up to an abundance mindset. And, and because in my former life, my past life, which I kind of say was like pre 2015, pre 2012, like when I was in my twenties and my thirties, I was very much a linear thinker. And, and again, you know, background in numbers. And that was always my zone of genius. And someone that I really respected invited me to a retreat. And he actually, he started off asking me if I was spiritual and I had never been asked that question. And I said, well, you know, not really. And he said, well, I would love for you to, and this is a person who is the president of the Colorado mortgage lenders association. And he had, he had owned a mortgage company as well. And he sold it and he became a coach, a writer and a speaker, which in the back of my mind, I had always wanted to do those things. I kind of always saw myself that way. And so when he invited me to this retreat, I had said, well, you know, I'm not really into nature walks and meditation. That's not really my jam, but I respected him and I trusted him. So I said, yes. And that was the first time that I was introduced to meditation. Just, you know, the idea of getting out of the chaos in our brain, which the brain is designed to think, and it is chaotic in there, especially in the world that we live in today, which there's so much competition for our attention and getting into my heart for the first time and really learning to be guided by another mechanism of knowing in our body. And it, it, I felt, I felt not only peace during those practices, but I felt a stronger sense of knowing that was, that was good, that, that I could trust in. And so I kind of carried that what I learned in that retreat forward. And then when I started reading the masters, and when I say the masters, I mean, Eckhart Tolle, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, Louise Hay, you know, some of these, let's call them um, conscious thinkers of our modern conscious thinkers of our day. You know, Dr. Joe Dispenza, I realized that they were all sort of teaching the same thing, which was to, to trust in our being, to trust in ourselves, to know that we are whole and complete and that everything that we need is actually already within us. And so I actually started practicing 
the affirmations, the giving. Cause I, again, I had lost a lot of income at that point And I was, I was in fear mode, you know, it's like, how am I going to support myself now in the world as a single woman? You know, do I go in? And I had some opportunities really good opportunities, but they weren't aligned with my core values. And so I just sort of fell back on, well, if I want to receive more, what's, what's the opposite of receiving it's giving. And so I started to give of my time, give of my energy, you know, give, give things that I didn't want or need anymore. I didn't have money at the time, but, and I saw those things coming back to me and I was like, wow, these abundance practices really work. And so I committed to them. And I made them a daily practice, which today it's, it's so interesting because I just default to, oh, I'm feeling anxious. I need a five minute, you know, five minutes of breath work or, um, you know, physically I'm not feeling good. I need to go outside and ground in nature and get in that high vibration of, of nature that we all actually are, you know, we all come from the same place. And so the abundance, you know, if you've ever known someone who just, they had sunshine following them everywhere they go, it's like they get money here and they launch something here and they get a raise there and stock options here, whatever. That's someone who has an abundant mindset. And that is another path to wealth is, is truly to raise your vibration. Again, going back to that quote, what you will be is what you do now. It's it's and what we do is based on how we feel inside. And so starting with how can I raise the vibration of how I'm feeling, the energy of myself so that I can start to attract the people, places and things that will that will come to me as in the form of money. You know, like it's okay to say I want more money. Like I want to be a millionaire. That is perfectly fine. Claim it, want it, go towards it. Feel it in your body and it will come. And I and I think many people are waiting for permission from someone to say, yeah, you can have it. You are enough. You do deserve this when you already are. And I know um, sometimes people feel like vibration. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's your energy. Put out what you want to receive back. And when you put that energy out there, you will really begin to shift. And uh, I love how you talk about that. And one of the most important things that you say in in order to achieve this is to make sure your life's in alignment with those values and your well-being. And if you start making decisions from that place, how will it impact somebody's spending? Ooh, yes. You know, I took an abundance course about three years ago with unity and unity is a spiritual movement, but they also have, um, it's, you know, it kind of gets confused as a church because they have services on Sunday. So through this unity, unity in Boulder, I took an abundance course. And my biggest takeaway from this course is that, cause we were talking about wants versus needs and, um, the person who was teaching, he said, you know, a want is only a want because we say it because we say we want it because we give it power. So as soon as we, as soon as I realized, like I think about myself, like, oh, I really want that, you know, expensive pair of earrings or or whatever it is. And it's outside my budget for that month. I can take a step back and again, getting out of my head and just <sighs> like taking a breath, getting into my body and thinking like, am I just giving this power? Like, is this really going to help me feel more of what it is that I value? Is this going to help? And and so taking the power away from once can be really powerful, especially, you know, if you're in a situation like I was, where truly I did not have any extra money when I started my wealth journey to put toward eliminating my debt. I really truly had to begin with decreasing my expenses And so I just looked at, you know, what is it that I don't need right now? It's temporary, right? It's like, what am I willing to part with for the next two to three years to eliminate my debt, knowing that what's on the other side of this is the freedom that I really want. And so I did that for a couple of years where I just started to reduce and or eliminate as many expenses as I could that weren't aligned with, with my values, you know, like coffee, for example, we all know that, you know, there's the, I think David Bach who wrote, um, the automatic millionaire actually trademarked the latte factor. 
And I might not be getting that exactly right, but it's something along the lines. We all know in personal finance, like we all talk about the $5 coffee a day and what that can turn into. And, um, and it is quite a lot of money, but for me thinking about, well, I really value my health because when I was young, this is actually how I got into debt in the first place. When I was 20 years old, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness. And for four years, I actually could not walk off and on. I was legally handicapped. Doctors told me that there was no known cause, no known cure. I'd probably be sick off and on for the rest of my life. And my medication was $5,000 a month and my insurance didn't cover it. So that's how I got into debt. But then it became, you know, it just, it, it snowballed because I wasn't really looking at it. But thinking about my health, okay, well, I'm going to go to Starbucks and I'm going to spend five or six bucks. Now it's like seven bucks on a latte that's full of sugar. Um, I'm, I have debt. So I'm trying to pay off things that I already bought in the past. I'm taking my time to go there. And it's like, wow, now I'm spending my time, my money, and it's really not so good for my health. And so right there, I was like, well, I can just eliminate that and feel awesome and replace it with something that makes me feel good. And so that was an easy one, you know? And, and then I also created a ton of spending rules for myself. Like <laughs> I had a 72 hour rule cause I was a, a, an impulsive spender. I still am where if I see something that I want to buy and I haven't already planned to buy it, then I give myself 72 hours. If I'm still thinking about it and I've got the cash in my monthly cash flow, then I'll allow myself to buy it. But like no more impulsive spending. I had never heard of someone giving themselves spending rules. So I'd love for you to expand a little bit more. About that. Okay. Oh man. I had so many, I mean, again, this is like, uh, around 15, 20 years ago, but when, when we still went to shopping malls, but I would not bring my wallet. Like I would leave my wallet in the car. Of course, now we have Apple pay and stuff, but like, if you're listening and you're an impulsive spender, like I am create some rules for yourself and, you know, disable your Apple pay. And then, you know, what we want to do is we want to create an environment that supports our goals. So another spending rule that I did was when I would walk into a, a grocery store or a store like target. So I would just disassociate because I'm, I'm an HSP, a highly sensitive person. And so I'm easily overstimulated. I didn't know that about myself until a few years ago, but I always knew that I was sensitive. And I always knew that something would happen to me when I would go into these stores where I just would feel, I would forget, why did I even come in here? And then I would just buy all the stuff that the signs told me to buy that were at eye level, whatnot. And so now when I go into a big store, not only do I have my list, but I keep my eyes focused, um, kind of higher and, um, and I don't allow myself to look at, at like the things that I'm, that they're trying to get me to look at. Cause I don't want the energy of that temptation because again, my attention, because I'm highly sensitive, it, it gets taken in a way for me. So I have to sort of uh, be proactive in that way. Um, you know, another rule is I don't shop at convenience stores or gas stations. Why? Because you pay a price for convenience. You pay a price for close parking. You pay a price for not having to run around a huge big box store. Um, and so I don't, you know, if I need something quick and I'm there fine, but like, I won't buy band-aids, Advil, anything that I can get at a big box store. I won't buy at a gas station or a convenience store. Cause I don't want to pay more. I also buy in bulk, um, you know, because I have a place to store 30 rolls of paper towels or, you know, a case of, of bottled water. I can do that, but I make it a point to shop at big box stores so that I can buy in bulk. So yeah, those are some of my, my, my shopping tips and spending rules that I created for myself. I love it. I absolutely love it. You also talk about having an awakening. And I know we might have touched on some of that, as well as you talk about a term called catch fire in your book. I'd love for you to share a little bit about the awakening and what does it mean to catch fire? Well, I, I had a couple of awakenings really. I mean, the first awakening was when I realized that I was living somebody else's version of success for me. And that was when 
I was 25 or 26 years old and we had three back-to-back snowstorms in Colorado, again, where I live. And I drove a Honda Accord and my office was 40 miles from my house. And at the time I had been feeling financial anxiety. I always felt like I was waiting for my paycheck to come in so that I could pay my bills. There was always more months left over than I had money. And because of these snowstorms, the whole state was shut down, but my office was open. And I realized that if I tried to drive my two wheel drive car on the highway, 40 miles to my office, that there's a potential that I might not make it. And so I called my boss and I told her, I felt like it was a risk for me to come into work. And she said, well, if you don't come in, you're fired. And then I started thinking about what that would mean for me. If I was fired, I wouldn't get my next paycheck which means that I wouldn't be able to make my mortgage payment, my car payment, my credit cards. And I'm thinking, how much credit card debt do I really have? Because I wasn't really looking at it. And I did go to work that day. I knew that I was risking my life for a job that I really didn't like. And I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Like, here I am. I got the good grades. I went to college. I bought the house. I got the job. Like I did all the things that I was taught to do to be successful and happy, but I was definitely not happy. And the success that I thought I had was actually just a bunch of debt. And so that night when I got home from work, I got out my credit card statements and that's when I discovered that I had the five figure debt. So I thought, okay, I'll call my financial advisor tomorrow. I'll explain to him what's going on and surely he will be able to help me. So I called him up, he listened. And the first thing he asked me, how much more money do you want to invest? And that was when that was the awakening. Like my, my brain basically exploded at that point. I was like, even my financial advisor cannot help me out of this situation that I'm in, which is ultimately, I just want more freedom and choices in life. And that was the moment that I committed to doing everything that I could to reach early financial independence. And I created a system from, you know, studying business in college, real estate, investing, entrepreneurship studied wealth management, personal finance, debt elimination, passive income. And I applied it to my personal finances, created this simple system. And three years later, I was debt-free. And then I had money in the bank. And then I became financially independent. And oh, along the way, you know, after a couple of years of eliminating the debt, just by reducing my expenses, I was like, wow, well, you know, if I just create a little bit more income, not a lot, you know, like 200 bucks, which then turned into three, which then turned into five and on and on. It helped me reach financial independence even faster. So I'm a, I love to teach people, how can you use your personal interests, unique skills, current resources to create another stream of income that's aligned with your core values? You know, how much time capital and energy do you have to devote to creating more income? Because for me, that was the key to reaching early financial independence. It's not for everyone. Some people would just rather push some buttons on their computer and put some money in those investment accounts. And that's another really great method to create FI. Going back to the other question that you asked, what is FIRE? FIRE is a movement. Financial independence, retire early. Now I bring it up because I think it's important. Again, this goes back to education and choices. Like we're not on the, all on the same path to wealth and that is perfectly okay. But there is a movement that advocates, and this is the fire movement for saving 70% of your income, 70%. And how do you do that? Well, you reduce or eliminate one or all of the top three line items of your budget, which for the average person is food, housing, and transportation. So we're talking eating beans and rice or ramen. We're talking sell the car and ride a bike or take public transportation. We're talking move in with mom and dad or get a roommate. And again, it's not for everyone. And you might choose to do one of these things or all of these things. But I will say that after six months of spending $5,000 a month on my medication, when I was only, you know, I just graduated from college. I think I was 22 years old. I, and I was living on the East coast. I was living in Boston. I decided to move back home and live with my parents and my ego hated that. And I felt like I had failed, but looking back, I know that I did one of the best things that I could have ever done for future Holly. 
for myself at that time, which was, I reduced my number one expense, which was rent by living at home. Cause they didn't charge me rent at that time. And not only that, I was in a nurturing environment with people who really cared about me. Yeah. And so maybe you're listening and you're thinking, huh, that's, that's interesting. What are some ways that you could just temporarily create a little bit of either income or reduce a big expense? And it doesn't have to be forever. And just, you know, committing to doing something that might be out of your comfort zone for, you know, say 12 months, Hey, maybe that could enable you to get some money in the bank so that you've got what I call a lighthouse fund, you know, six months of lifestyle expenses, just sitting in the bank for a rainy day in case you're not able to work. Like how much better would you feel about your state of, um, of existence, of living state of being, knowing that you're taken care of if you can't work. That's, that's enough to like settle your nervous system and create some space in your heart and maybe your mind to create another stream of income or to spend more time with your kids or to spend more time in nature, whatever it is that you value. You know, Holly, we're coming to the end with the interview, but I just want to thank you for sharing just your wisdom and your personal journey. Um, I, I think it's so important to tell the story of how we can make different choices to lead to that freedom to shift our mindsets, to be in a place of abundance versus scarcity. And that we, it starts simply with safety, feeling safe in in the environment where you can nurture yourself. And I know one of the things that you also talked about is when you, who you surround yourself with, your environment, those are all influencing who you become. And what you do now, relating back to that quote, so, so powerful. So I want to thank you for sharing all those nuggets of wisdom. Mm. You're welcome, Deborah. This has really been such a pleasure to chat with you about this very important topic. Well, as always, we have two questions I love to ask at the end of the interviews is what is one book that has completely transformed your life? And it can't be the one you wrote. (laughs) because <laughs> oh, I know there's so many like books that transform my life. <laughs> you know the very first book I ever read that was kind of a personal development book was Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich mm-hmm. and you know it's kind of one of the original law of attraction books but that book really resonated for me it made me feel like hmm I can do this you know like I can be whoever I want to be and and it's up to me and I, and being someone who loves control <laughs> that book, it, it definitely shaped who I am today. Yeah. And, and I think it does come down to that firm belief in yourself and that trust in knowing that everything's working out exactly the way it needs to be. And as long as you're putting in the efforts that lead to that direction, you need to trust that what you've been doing is going to Get, bring things to fruition. Yes. Speak sister. I love that you talked about action. <laughs> it is about taking, we have to take action in alignment with our goals. Mm-hmm. 100%, 100%. And the last question is what does it mean to you to live rich from the inside out? Ooh. Uh, well, again, my rich life is simple. <laughs> I love having an abundance of time to get out in the mountains, to ride my bike, to spend with my partner, to buy delicious, beautiful, high quality food and cook it. You know, that that's my rich life. I do love luxury. I do live in a luxury condo and a conscious community in Denver. And it's, it's wonderful. And it's a beautiful It's a beautiful existence, but when it really comes down to it, it is about having freedom to spend my time taking care of my mind, body, and soul. Isn't that the truth? It really comes down to that, having that peace of mind with all the decisions that you make and feeling true to yourself, ultimately at the end of the day and not living someone else's life. Yes. How can everyone stay in touch with you? (laughs) 
two ways. You can find me at financialimpact.com and also on Instagram at Holly Morph is my handle. And she has tons of free resources on her website to get you started, to help shift that mindset and help you align with your values and your well-being. Thank you so much, Holly, for joining us here on the Millionaire Woman Show. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Deborah. You can also go over to my website at www.debrakosowski.com. You're going to get your 10-page Reset Your Mindset PDF. And we are going to have all the details in the show notes for you to connect with Holly, her, her website, so you can get those free resources. And don't forget to get a copy of the book, Simple Wealth. You can hold that up again to let everybody see your book. And uh, it's an amazing book, easy read. I love the language in the book. I highly recommend this book for you on your journey to your financial wealth, simple wealth. As Mahama Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And as always, go out and make today great. <laughs>